And so we are in Christianity versus the world religions. We're studying various religions of the world and we're comparing them to Christianity. And tonight we're going to do Christianity versus Hinduism. Christianity versus Hinduism. And of course, uh, we've got the study sheets back there, lesson notes uh, back there. Uh, for those of you who forgot to get them, you can go back and grab one. And those who are watching online, uh, those are available uh, on BibleTalk.tv. A lot of people, you know, they watch on uh, YouTube or Vimeo or whatever, and they write us and say, where, where, where is that bonus material? Well, you have to go to the BibleTalk.tv website to go get the bonus material. So uh, just a reminder. All right, so lesson number four, Christianity versus uh, Hinduism. So we've uh, completed the Near Eastern religions, and uh, these are the ones that uh, we're probably more familiar with, right? Because in the Near Eastern uh, religions, we have uh, Christianity and we have Judaism and we have Islam. And so we're kind of familiar with those religions. And of course, we, we looked at Zoroastrianism. But now as we uh, go to some other religions, we're a little less familiar with the ones that we're going to talk about uh, tonight, for example. You know, when we talked about uh, Judaism, Judaism is the oldest of the religions and we can easily see the influence that it has had on others. Very old uh, documents, uh, of course, that uh, speak of things that took place at the very beginning of the world. Uh, the connection with Christianity is well known to us. We've discussed it already. And we can see traces of the Jewish influence in the ideas of Zoroaster, for example, that we looked at last week, right? Monotheism, uh, the idea of a righteous God, of good deeds. Even the angel Gabriel is in the religion of Zoroaster, something borrowed from the Jewish religion. And even in Islam, there is recognition of Judaism and much of their ideas about God uh, as a, a monotheistic God um, and the idea of righteousness and uh, basic principles of salvation. A lot of ideas in Islam come from Judaism and Christianity as well. Even ideas uh, out of Catholicism <laughs> are in the religion of uh, Islam because it is really a syncretic religion. You know, it, it took a lot of ideas from other religions. So once we enter the Eastern religions, we leave the familiar ideas of ancient Judaism and we enter a world of truly foreign ideas. And that brings us to Hinduism. The uh, word Hindu uh, simply uh, comes from the original word for the country of India. It means one who comes from India. Since the religion is so fundamental to the area, and to the people uh, and the religion, many times uh, the religion and the people and everything, they all carry the same name. However, in modern usage, the term Hindu and Hinduism refers to religion and not nationality as it once did very far in the past. Uh, Hinduism is the oldest organized religion in the world, still in existence today. It is uh, very complex. It dates back to uh, perhaps uh, 2000 uh, BC. Now you heard me say before that Judaism is the oldest religion. Well, yeah, well, Judaism talks about the beginning of the world and the, the promise of the Savior, you know, that runs through the Old Testament into the New Testament. Well, you know, it's given at the beginning of the world. But as far as organized religions are concerned, Hinduism is the oldest organized religion going back, tracing it back to 2000 BC. Uh, it's a religion that is confined almost exclusively to India and finds its roots in the social and geographical and primitive religions of this land. And in other words, Hinduism is also a mixture of many different religions that come together to form one religion. Uh, the founder uh, of uh, this uh, religion uh, is, we don't know. 
There is no founder, you know, like the founder of Christianity, Jesus Christ. Well, there is no founder in Hinduism. It is a religion that evolved as the thinking and the practices and the influences of geography and society affected the people of that region and they reacted to it in both physical and spiritual ways. We can say that Hinduism began as a nature religion. We talked about native religion, excuse me, nature religions. Remember when we talked about primitive religions, unorganized religions, mainly worshiping nature, rivers, the sun, the stars, this type of thing. Well, Hinduism began as a nature religion. The formulation of the religion itself began uh, as a priesthood arose to become the mediators of the natural and supernatural elements of this religion. So at the beginning, it was a nature religion practiced by people generally, independently of each other, uh, worshiping uh, you know, various uh, trees and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, uh, nature objects. Uh, but then there arose a group of priests, shamans, witch doctors, whatever, in various areas, who began to uh, uh, cultivate, uh, who began to teach the people uh, some of the ideas of the uh, nature religions uh, that they were practicing. And so this rise of a special class of people gave birth to a stratification of the entire social system of that country which still exists today and which is the most important element of this religion and of this society. You see what I'm saying? One group rose up, the priests if you wish, the special religious group, and then after this group rose up, other groups, other stratas of that society began to form. With time there developed four stratas or castes you know, as they call them, within the society. Uh, the first caste, or caste, if you wish to use that uh, pronunciation, were the Brahmin caste. They were the priestly group, the shamans, the witch doctors, but eventually the priestly caste. They were also the philosophers. They had the highest social position in that society. They were the guardians of the social heritage of that country and its history. The next group, the Kshatriyas, they were the warriors and the lords, the military people. Uh, today, they would be the politicians and bureaucrats. Uh, so the word Raja, you hear that all the time, a Raja, uh, that word meant a ruler. And then you have the word uh, Maharaja, well, that means great ruler. Well, that was that particular stratification, the second stratification, the second case, if you wish. The third, the Vaisyas, uh, they were the commercial class. They were the business people. They were the middle class, the shopkeepers, and these people uh, uh, formed uh, the third class. And then the fourth class, the Sudras, they were the, the artisans and the blue collar workers, if you wish and the people who worked in the service industries. And these were very strictly enforced stratas of that society. The priestly class, the warrior or military class, politician class, the commercial class, the artisan, the blue collar class. And then there was one other class and they were, they were not a caste, they were the outcast, where the term comes from, they were the outcast. Those were the beggars and the poor and the illegitimate. They also had a caste. They were not even considered as existing in society. Now these four castes plus the outcasts are subdivided into thousands of substructures. So the Brahmin class has all kinds of you know, sub structures within that class. And each class has thousands of substructures within each class. But several things remain sure. First of all, 
there's no intermarrying. If you're in the warrior class, you don't marry anybody who's in the commercial class. If you're in the artisan class, you don't marry in the Brahmin class. There is no marriage from one class to another, to another class. Even if you're an artisan and you become famous as an artisan, as a singer, and you become you know, world famous and you become a millionaire and you're able to build yourself a huge house and you, you, know, you can buy whatever you want, it doesn't matter. You still can't marry up. You still can't get out of your caste, out of your strata, if you wish. There's no changing of the castes. You can't buy your way out. Uh, everyone, and here's the point, everyone agrees to this from top to bottom. And you wonder why, why does everybody agree? The answer is because of their religion, that's why. Everyone agrees to this system because their religion is what enforces the system. Their idea of deity, their concept of deity, Brahma, the Brahmans, they were the priests. They served Brahma, pure spirit. He is the ultimate life power of the universe. Brahma does not have personality, is not considered a being, if you wish. Hindus do not pray to Brahma as we pray to the Father, or to, to, to Jesus. Brahma gives life to lesser gods who in turn create and operate in the world. Okay. Their concept of mankind, concepts, well, first concept is Atman, the condition of the true self, which is the perfect harmony between the soul and the physical body. This is the ultimate goal. We'll talk about that a little later. These are concepts of mankind. Another concept, Maya. This is the idea that the entire world is only an illusion. The purpose of religion is to detach oneself from the illusion of the world. Very important idea. And then there's the caste system. This system is a divine system not to be tampered with. Of course, these ideas developed throughout centuries of life in difficult social and geographical conditions. The Hindu religion is a, a case of of, of a people adapting their religion to fit their suffering. It's a religion that justifies the inequalities of life and offers detachment as the only hope. Think about it. You live in an incredibly poor country where only a few of the people have enormous wealth and the majority of the people have nothing. So what, what does your religion promise you? Well, your religion promises that if you do everything you're supposed to do, you will finally be detached from this awful world of poverty and suffering. You'll be detached from it. It doesn't promise you that you, you know, you're, you're awake and uh, you're conscious of this terrible world that you're in and then your reward is you're detached from this and you're plugged into another world where it's wonderful, it's paradise, like Islam, for example. No, 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 no. In Hinduism, you are detached and you are absorbed by Brahma into nothingness. Now this idea and, and this detachment, by the way, is the only hope that people have, the only hope. Now this religion here maintains order in a continent where over a billion people are jammed together and live one on top of another. It maintains order and it offers a, a type of hope, if you wish. 
their idea of salvation in Hinduism. Moksha, moksha is the term. It means merging, to merge. And so salvation is moksha. This is the objective of all life and the concept of salvation. Moksha is when the soul of man merges or becomes one with Brahma. The result is freedom from this world and oblivion, no consciousness. You know, in Christianity we said the salvation is you're still you, you're still conscious of who you are, but you are changed to be without any sin, without any imperfection. And then you are attached, if you wish, to God in order to have a personal relationship with God that is going to last forever and never be interrupted by sin or anything else. That's the promise that Christians have. The promise that Hindus have is they'll, they'll be detached and they'll be changed all right, but they'll be changed into nothingness. No more consciousness of uh, who they are, okay? And so how do you get to this point? Well, you perform good deeds in devotional services like temple worship, for example, or you avoid bad karma. Ever hear about that? You avoid bad karma. Hindus believe that good and evil deeds move you ahead or pull you back from moksha, from merging. The evil that you do encrusts on your soul and its journey. So you have to avoid bad karma because bad karma slows you down. Now remember, if you were living in a paradise and you had all the food that you needed and you were comfortable and you had fun and your kids were healthy and you, you could travel and you could do anything that you wanted, well, you, know, you wouldn't be in such a hurry to go into oblivion. <laughs> but if you live with 19 other people in a space the size of my office, for example, with no indoor plumbing, yeah, may, maybe you might be in a hurry to get out of that situation. Oblivion might sound pretty good to the person who only eats one meal uh, a day. Another term, uh, jana marga, which is knowledge. In other words, how do you achieve this moksha? Well, one, one way is through works, good works. Another way is through knowledge. Through the acquiring of knowledge, there may be an instant insight that will produce instant moksha. That's another way of achieving moksha, through knowledge. And then a third way, bhakti marga, this is the way of devotion. Moksha through emotional experience, ritualistic dances, ecstatic experiences. In other words, the people who follow the bhakti marga are the Pentecostals of the Hindu religion, if you wish. Yoga, for example, is an exercise used to achieve release to moksha. It's, a, it's a, an exercise used to enable you to move forward in your journey to that ultimate goal. Here in the West, most times people use yoga simply as an exercise to improve their health. But in Hinduism, uh, uh, yoga has many spiritual uh, connotations and Many groups here in the West use yoga as a kind of a, a way to teach people about Hinduism. Their cultists, in other words, their worship practices. Their worship practices, well, worship is all directly related to obtaining moksha. So you have temple worship, yoga, readings for knowledge. All activities lead to uh, moksha. All right, so let's talk about the scriptures uh, in uh, Hinduism. 
uh, several works uh, developed over centuries. Uh, they, don't, uh, uh, they don't rest their authority on revelation. Our holy book, the Bible, is based on the idea that it's a revelation from God, but this, uh, the, the, the Hindu scriptures are not based on revelation. You have the Brahma, the Brahmanas, there we go, the Brahmanas, uh, which are religious ceremonies, they're mantras, uh, and these uh, uh, are mantras uh, dealing with various chants. Uh, this particular uh, uh, group of literature written between 1000 and 700 BC, written in the language of Sanskrit. The uh, Aaron Yakas, uh, which is folk wisdom and mythology. The uh, up, uh, Upanishads, uh, which are philosoph uh, philosophical books. The Bhagavad Gita's uh, Hindu poetry from the third century. Uh, let me read you a little bit uh, from uh, one of these uh, books, the uh, Bhagavad Gita's. Um, uh, it says here, lesson on the second, the Lord spake. It says, never have I not been, never hast thou, and never have these princes of men not been, and never shall time yet come when we shall not all be. As the body's tenant goes through childhood and manhood and old age in this body, so does it pass to other bodies. The wise man is not confounded therein. And so there's a talk about Krishna, who is one of the three lesser gods under Brahma. I remember that song, was it by George Harrison? That's what he talked about. He talked about Krishna, he was talking about one of the gods in the Hindu, in the Hindu uh, deity. With the arrival of Christianity, this particular god Krishna was fashioned in style and work after the person of Christ by the Hindu writers. And so you can be a Hindu and you can still believe in Jesus as well. Because in Hinduism, the more gods, the better it is. You got more gods, it's great. There's not a, not a problem. Uh, with that. It, it, it was a problem for Christian missionaries, early Christian missionaries who worked in India because they thought they were making converts. And they didn't realize that for the Hindus, yeah, I believe in Jesus, Jesus, the son of God. Absolutely, I believe in that. And they're thinking, wow, we got a convert. And they didn't realize that at the time anyways, that well, they weren't really getting a convert. Uh, they, they, they were simply adding another God to their, uh, to their deities. Uh, there is also the Laws of Manu, a book uh, entitled The Laws of Manu, written 250 BC, an attempt to codify Hindu laws and commands. And then the Vedas, uh, the oldest of the books, all the way back 2000 BC, poetry, musings about the primitive Hindu faith. So, a variety of different books, none of them claiming inspired by God or by Brahma, but simply different types of writing, religious writing, philosophical writing. The geography, um, uh, primarily in India. However, it influenced uh, religions that sprang from it to other countries. When we study Buddhism, we'll see a lot of the similarities with uh, Hinduism. Again, we finish off usually with miscellaneous information. Uh, Hindus believe in re reincarnation. What I read to you before was the idea of incarnation. Uh, it's a basic belief of Hinduism. It is the concept that the soul continues to migrate through the creation until it reaches moksha. And so one could reincarnate as someone in another caste, for example. A person can go from uh, uh, being a craftsman to in another life becoming a priest or uh, go from the priestly case uh, down to the outcast uh, because they had bad karma. Uh, this reincarnation continues to happen until moksha finally takes place. This is why they don't change the system because to do so is futile it will not help moksha. You know, bringing in a democratic system will not help or hinder moksha. 
Everything is designed to point people towards that end. This is why cows are sacred. You ever wonder why cows are sacred in India? Cows are wandering around with the people. People are starving to death and yet there's a thousand pound you know, cow right next to them. They would never think of killing it. And this is because cows represent the final step before reaching ultimate moksha. So if you were to kill a cow, uh, that is truly bad karma for you because you have killed the opportunity of the spirit that was in that cow to finally make it to moksha. Uh, you see many times women have a dot on their forehead. Um, it's called a bindi, B-I-N-D-I, usually red, usually worn by a married woman, uh, placed on the forehead between the eyebrows because Hindus believe this is a concentration point in the body for wisdom. And it is the point where the body's energy is concentrated. Uh, the Hindu greeting, the namasta, you know, this here, uh, the word means to greet. It is a, a, a non-contact form of greeting. Uh, for those who are suffering from the contact, uh, from the COVID-19, uh, their greeting is a, a great uh, greeting because they don't have to touch anyone, shake hands, fist bump or do anything. They've already got that down. Uh, when the hands are put to the forehead, it is a gesture of worship. In Hindu or in the Hindu religion, the namasta is a way of saying, the spirit in me respects the spirit in you. Usually the younger person initiates uh, before an older person as a sign of uh, respect. Well, there are some of the you know, major ideas. Uh, certainly if we have some folks out there who uh, are watching online or see this later on and they themselves are Hindu, Hindus and follow this religion, you will realize that I have not gone very deeply into it. It's a very complex religion, but those are some of the major ideas about this religion, especially their concept of salvation and their relationship with God. All right, next time we get together, we're going to do again two religions. One is called Jainism and the other is called Sikhism. And we will review those two religions in our series entitled Christianity versus World Religions. That's it for tonight. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you next time.